right good evening um we are going to start looking at p3 tonight um one uh, one of the physics topics uh, and then tomorrow night we'll look at p4 now p3 um there's it's a lot about car safety it's a lot about how cars travel it's a lot about um kinetic energy and also there's a lot of equations uh, in that topic so um i'm going to run a little competition tonight um, to see how many times I actually say the word equation um, because I bet it'll be quite a few and if anyone comes to school tomorrow uh, and tells me how many times I say equation <laughs> uh, on uh, this video then uh, I'll give you a positive sleuth because it's meant you've uh, watched the whole thing okay so first of all let's get a uh, powerpoint on okay present everyone Hopefully I'll get a bit faster at this. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Right, so P3 then. Um, I'm hoping. Let's see if it will present tonight and skip through the slides a bit easier. Okay, so we are looking at P3. And I've just realised... Um, I've got my phone by the side of me, so if anyone wants to email at any stage uh, with any questions or queries, or just to say that you're watching it, uh, I'm, not, I'm not on my own, then uh, please let me know. Okay, so we're going to have a look at speed, distance, time. Um, we're going to look at acceleration, uh, thinking, braking and stopping distances, work done, uh, transport and energy, uh, how energy is absorbed through collisions and car safety, falling objects and the balance of forces and then we're going to look at theme park rides okay ah it's working tonight right so the first equation we're going to look at tonight is the one for measuring uh, speed so um this used to be um a grade c sort of skill where you were asked to try and work out the time uh, if you were given the distance and the speed however because uh, it's now become really easy to use it's actually gone down to a grade e skill uh, but also um, I think you need to know this for maths now when it comes to speed speed is measured in meters per second that is the usual units for it however always be careful of the um, exam question and have a look at the um, what it's actually asking because sometimes they'll ask you to convert from meters into kilometers or seconds into minutes or minutes into hours okay and also you might also have questions where it's got uh, miles per hour and um, so this is the equation you'll be given at the front of your paper just as it is here and if you are asked to work out the time um, in this equation then um, I, I know that if it was me and I had to try and change sides and change signs, I get all confused. So what I do is I like to put all of my equations into a triangle. And even if you've got more than three parts to the equation, you can still fit them into um, this equation in this in triangle. So um, if you can see the divide line there, if you've got a divide line in your equation anywhere, if there is something above the divide line, that always goes at the top of the triangle. And then the other two parts, so in this case, speed and time, will go at the bottom. And it doesn't matter which way around they are on the bottom, you just put a multiply uh, in between. So now this is easy, because if I wanted to work out the time, if I put my hand over the time, then I can work out that distance divided by speed will give me the time. If I put my hand over speed, then distance divided by time uh, will give me my speed. And if I needed to work out the distance, then it'd be time times speed. Okay, so a really easy equation uh, for you to use. But as I said, just be careful of your units here. Also, if you look at your marks as well, that usually gives you a little indicator because if it's only for one mark, it's a straightforward calculation. If it's for two, then you might have to do some kind of conversion. No, stop. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, there it goes working. 
Okay, so if you're asked anything about speed cameras and how they work, um, there's two different types of speed cameras you need to think about. The first one is just outside school on the Chester Road, we've got some speed cameras just there, and the speed is set at 30 miles an hour. Okay, so that, if you look on the road, there are marks on the uh, actual road, and that's where the distance has actually been measured out. Um, so as the car goes over the first line, then um, the camera will take note that you've gone over the first line, and then um, as you go over the last line, it will work out the difference. And if you've gone over those two uh, lines too quickly, then it can work out that your speed is too fast and it can uh, take a picture and send you a nice fine through the post and three points on your license. So um, that's the first type of speed camera. Okay, so if you get asked any exam question about speed cameras and what you need in order to work it out, the two things are you need the distance and the time and then the camera will work out the speed. Now the other type of camera is the average speed camera. So if you go onto the um, the motorway, for instance, it's usually around about where they're doing road works. Um, you will see average speed cameras, and what that means is that as you pass the first camera, um, the camera will take a picture. Okay, um, and the camera knows uh, because it's been set that it will take a certain time, if you're doing the right speed, it will take a certain time for you to reach the second camera. So if you reach it too quickly, then you're travelling too fast, and then the camera will take a picture and send you a nice little fine through the post and three points on your licence. Um, so you need to be thinking about these things uh, for when you start your uh, driving next year. Okay, need to go on to the next one. No, do not work. PowerPoint doesn't work very well, on here. Ah, right, okay. Right, graphs. Now, you will be presented with all sorts of different varieties of graphs, either distance time graphs or speed graphs or uh, whatever it is. And I always say, take time to have a look at what the graph is telling you, okay? And I always try to picture something what is it that's actually moving here? Okay, so if I look at the bottom, I can see that my time is increasing in seconds. So if I count it up to nine, then I can see that something has moved 10 meters in three seconds, for instance. Well, I should imagine that could be a person, um, or the chances are it might be something else. So I'll just sort of think about that, you know, is it a car or a, or a cycle, do we think? Okay, so um, over three seconds then, it's moved 10 metres. And then between A and B, so between three and six seconds, so it took three seconds for this object to move from 10 to 70 metres. So that means in three seconds, this object has moved 60 metres. So it could well be a car. Okay, so first of all, I'd have a look at the graph and what is it actually telling me? And then here at the top, after B, you can see that the time's still going on, but it's not moving anywhere. So the chances are that this object is probably stationary now. <coughs> Excuse me. So you may be asked to work out the gradient of the graph. And again, it's Y divided by X. So measure the distance for Y, measure the distance for X for whichever times it's giving you, and then it's y divided by x to work out what's going on. Right, okay. So these then are speed time graphs. So again, it would be sort of quite similar to um, the uh, last graph that we just showed you, but instead of uh, distance time, you'll have speed time. So you might be asked then to look at what these lines are actually telling you. So a slope will represent the acceleration of an object. A constant acceleration gradually increases the speed at a uniform rate because it's travelling at constant acceleration. It's not going faster and slower, it's just constantly going up. 
the steeper the slope the bigger the acceleration but then if the slope starts to go down then that's telling you that whatever it is is decreasing in speed and if you've got a horizontal line this means it's traveling at a constant speed okay so where is the last one the horizontal line meant that whatever it was wasn't moving this one just means it's moving at a constant speed so up is accelerating across is constant speed and down is decelerating and if you're not sure go and speak to Mr Poyot and ask him to show you his karate moves and how he does that with the, his uh, graphs it was a very interesting lesson okay so if you're asked um, how you could calculate the distance travelled um, on a particular speed time graph then it is the total distance um, is calculated by using half times speed times time and really it's just the area that's underneath the uh, line um, that tells you your total distance but usually they break the question down and ask you for a certain little section or they might ask you to calculate the three sections where it's accelerating going at constant speed or going down <coughs> okay so we're back on to equations again so here's the next one and please don't worry you don't have to learn these equations you just have to know what to do with them if you're asked a question so acceleration change in speed per second it's a measure of how quickly an object speeds up or slows down okay because if something's accelerating it's getting faster if something's decelerating it's getting slower okay now whereas speed was meters per second um, acceleration is meters per second squared <coughs> in fact while we're on this um, I just want to talk about the difference between speed and velocity speed is how fast something is traveling in any direction whereas velocity is how fast something's traveling in one direction so please be aware of that so as long as you're traveling in a straight line that's velocity okay so back to acceleration then now acceleration is measured in meters per second squared because it means every second you are getting faster and faster so it's for every meters per second you're increasing per second so if you're asked to work out then the acceleration of something again you can take this equation and you can put it into this triangle okay there's the divide line again okay so there's the divide line so anything above the divide line goes at the top of the triangle so change in speed will go at the top and then that means acceleration and time must go at the bottom and again if you're asked to work out the acceleration cover over the acceleration and it'll be changing speed divided by time if you're asked to work out the time changing speed divided by acceleration and so on okay I do love these little triangles to show these equations mm -mm. can I turn the slide over come on it does go very slow come on it's like it's got a catch up ah, there we go okay so we're now looking at forces and really it's saying here a force is a push or a pull but if you work at the Institute of Physics, I'm sure you'll be saying, no. Um, it's all to do with um, the, uh, I can put it, see, I forgot already, I can't even say it. Um, how much force is exerted. Oh, when Grant, Mrs. Brown just emailed me. Let's have a look, see what she wants to say. Uh, no. So, Mrs. Brown was going to maybe have a special word to make sure her class are watching. Just let me just email her. Do you want a special word in video for your class to check? They are revising. Yeah, right. Send that to it okay so um force is a concept like energy and therefore cannot be precisely defined and um, because really um i sort of think about it if um 
if I pushed something, if I was standing against a wall and I was pushing it with my hand, I'm exerting a force on that wall because I'm pushing against it. I'm releasing energy from my arm to push into that wall. And the same would be if I was in a tug of war, if I was pulling on the rope, I would be putting energy in to pull on the rope. Okay, so we say that a force is the result of an interaction between two objects or fields. And the units are Newton's, oh, let's see what his brain says. Okay. So, um, units are Newton's. Now, the resultant force acting on an object is related to the object's mass and acceleration. So, if I've got something that's one kilogram, uh, and I'll put it on uh, the table, then that's going to be uh, exerting a force on that table. Um, but if I put something that's 10 kilos, then obviously there's going to be more of a force pulling it down. Um, now, what you need to remember is, if ever you're talking about gravity, for every one kilogram block on Earth, there are 10 newtons acting on it. So if you had to work that out, um, if I had my one kilogram block sitting on the table, one times 10 would be 10. Whereas if I had a 10 kilogram block, 10 times 10 means 100 newtons of force are pulling that, um, that block down. So when we're talking about resultant forces, um, if I had a ball, and this is where I need my pen and paper again so I can draw it, it drives me mad this does. If I had a ball um, and it had got 10 newtons of force, 10 newtons of drive going that way, but it only had 5 newtons um, of uh, air resistance acting against it, that means it would have um, a resultant force of 5 moving in one direction. So that would be 10, take away 5 is a resultant force of 5. So I'm just trying to change the slide, but it's not doing it. Mm -mm. Like this. Do it like that then. Play on it. Okay, so if you're asked then to calculate a force, okay, again, we're back to another equation, one you don't have to remember, um, but um, you do need to know, oh, see, it moves now, uh, one you do need to know how to manipulate again. So if you're asked to work out, you're told the force, you're told the acceleration, but you need to know the mass. Again, look, there's no divide line on this side, Okay, so because you've got mass times acceleration, those two must go at the bottom of the triangle. So if those two are at the bottom, there's my divide line again. So it must mean the force goes at the top. So if I want to work out the mass of something, I'll cover that over. So my calculation is now force divided by acceleration. If I want acceleration, it's force divided by mass. And if I want the force, then it's mass times acceleration. Okay. And you can see the uh, units there. Force is always in newtons. Uh, mass is generally in kilograms. Acceleration, meters per second squared. Okay, this next part of the topic um, really does sort of drive me mad um, because it's really easy, which students tend to lose a lot of marks on this. Um, and it's because they're not being very specific in their answers. Okay, so when we're talking about the overall stopping distance of a car, so you're driving along in the car, and a lot of you will be taking your driving tests in the next couple of years. Um, you're driving along in your car, and let's just say um, you see, um, I don't know, a little kid running the road. Okay, from the time you actually see that little kid running the road, um, for you to actually think about it and for you to then like send your message down to your foot to put your foot on the brake is your thinking distance okay then you put your foot on your brake and from the time you put your foot on the brake to the time your car stops um, that's your braking distance add the two together and that is your overall stopping distance okay now the thing is if you're traveling faster 
your thinking distance is going to be longer your breaking distance is going to be longer so that's usually a pretty good answer however this is the thing that drives me mad is when they ask you what factors could affect your overall thinking distance and when people say age I think to myself well hang on a minute someone who's 17 has got an age someone who's 50 has got an age someone someone who's 70 has got an age so you must say old age uh, slows down reaction times the driver is ill tired un under the influence of drugs or alcohol and um, the driver's distracted or not fully concentrating or there is poor visibility all of those things do affect the thinking distance you really are unless it actually states in the question about drink and drugs you really are um, just go to this answer or oh, the vehicles traveling faster means the stopping distance will be long uh, sorry the thinking distance will be longer now the same goes for this part the braking distance is increased if the vehicle is traveling faster well that makes sense because if you're traveling faster it's going to take longer to stop there are poor weather conditions or road conditions lots of people just put the weather well what about the weather a nice sunny day is the weather um, but what about you have to say that it's raining or it's icy or it's snowing and that increases the uh, braking distance um, the vehicles in poor condition some people just put oh the brakes what about the brakes you might have just had brand new ones fitted uh, and tires are worn out and um, tires not inflated properly also the mass of the vehicle if you've got more passengers in there it's going to take longer to stop the car okay so please remember to be really specific because lots of people like i say lose marks um on that bit okay right now before i move on i just want to check that you're all still with me and i'm not lost you all oh no it's looking good looking good let me just check uh stop screen sharing oh there you are <laughs> equations how many of us said bye now mm. we've even got some sweets left i might give you some sweets right so let's go back uh oh what's this internal display no, I don't want that. I want to go to... No, I don't want that. Yeah, I'm going to right, okay. Present to everyone. Right, I'm going back on it. <sighs> okay. So, kinetic energy. Um, kinetic energy is quite a big part of this topic. Um, and really, uh, it can get you through um, quite a few um, questions. okay so hopefully you'll remember that kinetic energy is movement energy so an energy an object has because of its movement again it's an energy so it's measured in joules all the energies are measured in joules and it depends on two things the mass of the object and the speed of the object and then you've got this equation again you're given this equation at the front of your book and this again is where I need a pen and paper. In fact, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to draw this equation on a piece of paper and I'm going to show it to you. Now, uh, kinetic energy. Hopefully, you're looking at this. All right, let's try again. Let's just put that on. Uh, hopefully you're looking at this now and trying to work out what goes above the divide line and what goes below. Okay. Um, and hopefully you can see that there is no divide line over on this right hand side. So that means kinetic energy must go above the divide line. And then you've got half times mass times speed squared. Now, you don't always um, have to have uh, speed. You can have velocity. Now, let's just see, because I need to show you this equation. Hang on. Oh, okay. Right. So, can you see? Hopefully, it's not very good. Any more board pen? Right. So, can you see then? Kinetic energy divided by half 
times mass times velocity squared. Now I've just changed that because on there it said speed squared, uh, but you can have velocity as well. Now the thing about this equation is half, if you put half into a calculator, you just put it as 0 0.5 times mass times velocity squared. Now there is one thing about this calculation that does catch people out and it is this bit here with the squared. Okay, did I say equation? We'll go back to my number. Okay, so. Right, can you see that? So, um, if you're asked to work out the velocity, what you need to do is you have kinetic energy. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Bless me. Um, you have kinetic energy divided by 0 0.5 times mass. So, whatever that is. Whatever that comes to, you've got to do something with this squared. Where you've got squared here, you would have to square root this whole um, answer. So let's just say it's kinetic energy divided by 0 0.5 times uh, the mass. Work that out and then square root the whole answer and that will sort out the square there. If you're not sure, um, come and see me um, and I will show you how to do it. I'm sure I said equation three more times in, so I'm adding three on. Okay, so let's go back to uh, the. Uh, let's go back to the. Okay. <coughs> okay, we'll come back to um, kinetic energy in a minute. Um, but this next part of the topic is looking at uh, fuels that you can use in cars. Now, I'm sure you will remember back to one of the other chemistry topics um, where we talked about uh, using biodiesel, for instance. Biodiesel, bio, comes from biology, living. It was a living thing that has been made into a fuel, into a diesel. If anyone watches Top Gear, uh, not for much longer, Anyone who watches Top Gear, um, then you will have hopefully have seen the episode where they decided to try and grow some biodiesel and grow the plant that makes biodiesel. So they planted the whole field um, and then discovered that they planted the wrong one because uh, that's work. so. Um, the main advantage is that the field could have been uh, the main disadvantage. Sorry, is the field could have been used for other plants for food, and we said this back in the topic C two. Okay. Also, you could use electric, um, uh, electric powered cars, and some people say, "Oh, that's much better because you're not burning fossil fuels." Well, actually, the electric's got to come from somewhere, and um, usually it's because you've had to burn fossil fuels uh, to make the electric. So, really, it's a, a bit of a cop out because you do still need the electric, so you still burn fossil fuels. Oh, there we go. So, vehicle fuel consumption. Um, better vehicle shapes can reduce their air resistance, which improves fuel consumption as well as giving them higher top speeds. Now, if any of you have seen like big um, Arctic lorries, over the weekend um, I saw one, I think it was from Marks and Spencers, and it had got a, a real round shape at the top. And it had actually got a sign on the back saying that it had been designed so that it was streamlined. And the more streamlined it is, uh, the better it is for fuel consumption uh, because that's the whole point. They're trying to show that they're being eco-friendly. Um, that's the way. That's why Formula One cars are so sort of low and they've got such a sharp angle um, because you're trying to get the, um, the air particles to flow over it as easily as possible. Now, if you uh, decide to uh, put a roof box on your car, then that means you're going to have uh, less fuel efficiency because the, um, you're going to increase the air resistance because the air particles smack into the roof box. Um, and so you've got to have more fuel to actually push the car through those air particles. So car fuel consumption depends on the energy required to increase kinetic energy, energy required to work against friction, your driving style and speed, different road conditions and tyre pressure. I'm seeing more and more exam questions come up with uh, these sorts of uh, conditions on. Okay, 
So here we've got two equations that you'll see uh, to do with movement again, because momentum really is just movement. Now, what you've got to be careful of here is, as I said, you've got two equations. And what this means is you may be asked a three mark question here where they ask you to work out the momentum for one and then you've got to put that into another one to uh, work out the force, for instance, or the time. So look very carefully at your exam question. Underline the parts that it gives to you and underline what you actually need to find out. Go back to your equations at the front of your paper and um, when you uh, see which one you need, then work it out from there and like I say you might need to take one from this equation and put it into this equation okay right car safety features you will see here there are some safety features um, that uh, are crucial and some that are quite useful okay seat belts for instance absolutely crucial um, they do, if you have ever been in a car and like someone like slams the brakes on, you'll feel like the seatbelt's like locked on you and you can't move. The thing is, it might feel like it's locked, but actually it does stretch slightly. Um, and the reason is, if it just stopped all of a sudden and locked, it would actually cause you more damage. Um, but it stretches slightly so that some of the energy can be absorbed from the person. Um, to stop you from going through a front windscreen, for instance. Airbags, again, they cushion the impact and absorb some of the kinetic energy. Brakes, reducing the speed of the car by transferring kinetic energy to heat energy. You'll see that this comes up quite a lot, and really, this is your sort of go-to answer quite a lot of the time. Think about kinetic energy, think about what's actually happening. Um, crumple zones on cars are actually designed to absorb the kinetic energy. Uh, the whole point of car design, and we're seeing it more and more these days, is when people have a crash, um, that uh, a lot of, the, well, not all the time, but quite a few of the times, people can actually walk away from it uh, because of the safety of cars. Um, you have, uh, like I say, crumple zones to absorb kinetic energy. You have uh, bars in the doors to absorb the energy, um, airbags to absorb the energy. You also have nowadays collapsible steering columns. Um, and these are designed so that if uh, the engine, if the front end of the car hits something, um, then the engine you used to push the whole car and the steering column into the person. Well, now the design so that the steering column actually collapses down and into the engine rather than into the person. The safety cage um, is uh, sometimes called a roll cage. So that if the car rolled, then it would stop uh, the person from the vehicle from actually collapsing in on the person. Um, the other one I just want to mention before I move on is anti locking braking system. Now, the way brakes used to work is the pads would um, push straight onto the cylinders and they would sort of lock. And by doing that, it meant the car would skid. Now, what it does is it sort of, um, the brake pad hits the cylinder, but then releases and hits it again and again and again, but really fast to reduce any uh, skidding. Okay. So there's some of the car safety features. If you're asked to describe them, you must talk about what they're actually designed for. And like I say, nine times out of ten, uh, you'll probably get away with saying absorbing kinetic energy. Okay, friction and air resistance. Uh, frictional forces um, can act against the movement of an object, slowing it down. can be reduced by changing the vehicle shape or using a lubricant. Uh, shaping of an object falling can influence its top speed and the falling objects speed up as they fall because they are pulled to the centre of the earth. So really we're just bringing together now a little bit about friction, a little bit about cars and a little bit about falling objects. Because hopefully, if you can go on to the next slide. Right, so 
we're bringing all of that together now because now we're talking about terminal speed or terminal velocity it just means the fastest you can possibly go okay so falling objects experience two forces the weight which always stays the same on earth and happens because of the pull of gravity now this is another one that we need to make sure you understand the difference between if you're talking about the mass of an object or you're talking about the weight of an object the mass is like saying how, how much stuff is in one thing so for instance if I looked at my body my body has got a certain mass it's got a certain amount of particles in it and if my body was on the earth or if it was on the moon it would still have that stuff in it however when gravity is pulling on it as well then I have weight and weight is measured in Newtons so if you take your mass for instance and multiply it by gravity that would be your weight so if a person was um, 70 kilograms for instance that would be their mass if they uh, then wanted to know their weight they would multiply that by 10 because for every one kilogram it's 10 newtons uh, pulling down on that uh, object so they, their weight would be 700 newtons so where you've been told you weigh yourself your whole life you've just been lied to because it's not weight that's just your mass okay so let's just think then about um, a falling object let's just think about a parachutist jumping out their weight will be pulling them down but then also they will have air resistance acting against them so when weight is bigger than air resistance the object speeds up when the air resistance is bigger than the weight the object slows down when the weight equals the air resistance uh, the object travels at constant speed or terminal velocity I'm get the next slide on she's driving me mad okay now the reason I'm saying this is because um, this graph here is quite a common one when we're talking about terminal velocity I usually like to talk about parachutists because it's a really good example of where forces um, and air resistance work against each other at different uh, levels so for instance this is where the parachutist has just jumped out of the aeroplane and you can see that their speed is increasing they're accelerating they're accelerating and it's because they are falling faster than the air resistance that's against them until they reach a point where they get to their steady speed they reach their terminal velocity they can't go any faster their acceleration down is balanced with the um, air resistance against them and then we get to this point and then they open their parachute and now because I've got a bigger surface area I'm now um, catching more air particles I've got more air resistance and that's going to slow me right down I'm going to decelerate okay until we get to here where um, we again reach the fastest possible speed we can fall but it's at a much slower terminal velocity than when the parachute was open because of the bigger air resistance now please be careful when you think about if you have to describe a parachutist because some people seem to think that when they open the canopy that um, they actually go back up into the air or well, they don't because what you've got to think is when the parachutist jumps out they are jumping out with a cameraman or woman at the same time so as the uh, camera person is taking uh, pictures um, and then when they open the canopy um, the parachutist um, decelerates really quickly but the cameraman is still traveling at the same speed which is what makes it look like they go up but actually they don't it's just that they um, decelerate okay right um, on to then gravitational potential energy now this is where um, and you may have a few questions based on this um, when we're talking about gravitational potential energy you usually find that they're talking um, about things like roller coasters 
Um, so when we're talking about gravitational potential energy, we're talking about going against gravity. So if I put that into context, if I got a bucket of water and I lifted it up and put it on top of a door, that bucket has now got gravitational potential energy because I've taken it away from the ground um, and it's sitting on the top of the door and it's got the energy ready to be released into kinetic energy. If I pick up a book and put it on a shelf two meters from the ground, it's got gravitational potential energy. It's got the potential to fall down to the ground. Um, so energy that an object has due to its position in the Earth's gravitational field, if it can fall, it has gravitational potential energy. To be like if I go to the park, if I go up the steps on a slide and I go to the top, I've got gravitational potential energy. Now, when I go down that slide, that gravitational potential energy is converting into kinetic energy. So, another example is, if two people of the same mass are standing on two diving boards, but one is higher, the higher person will have more gravitational potential energy because it's further away from the ground. If two people of different masses are stood on the same diving board, the person with the heavier mass will have more gravitational potential energy. When an object falls, it transfers gravitational potential energy in kinetic energy uh, and objects kinetic energy increases as the gravitational potential energy decreases. Because it is that law, um, the conservation of energy law, where we say that energy is only ever transferred from one type to another. It's never created or destroyed okay so gravitational potential energy equals mass times gravitational field strength and as i said on earth that's 10 newtons per kilogram now it's actually 9.8 but the example would generally say is 10 and if it wants you to say anything else it will tell you that in the question times the vertical height okay so really if you think about it if you're asked a question does uh, the mass affect gravitational potential energy Put some numbers in. So if I said 1 times 10 times 10, okay, well, that's 100. If I doubled my mass to 2, 2 times 10 is 20, times 10 is 200. So does the mass make a difference? Yes, it does. Put some numbers in. Uh, think about it logically. This is where things is. Ah, there you go. So, like I say, one of the most common examples of where gravitational potential energy converts into kinetic energy um, is on most roller coasters. So the cars start high up with a lot of gravitational potential energy. As the car drops, the gravitational potential energy is gradually transferred into kinetic energy. The car reaches its highest speed or maximum kinetic energy at the bottom of the slope. And then as the car climbs the slope again on the other side, the kinetic energy is converted back into gravitational potential energy and it slows down. It's a bit like, um, it's quite interesting because uh, Oblivion at Alton Towers sometimes doesn't have enough mass in the car to actually push it over the top. Um, and uh, what is it, Stealth, is it, at Thorpe Park, the one that goes right up and over? If you haven't got enough mass on the car, it doesn't get... Uh, enough um, gravitational potential energy to actually take it over the top to convert into kinetic energy and it just rolls back down. Have a look on YouTube, it's quite, some quite funny uh, videos on that. Yeah. Right, now this I think is my last slide but there are some really crucial laws here. Um, these two here, I can't stress enough, you must learn these, okay. If the mass of the car is doubled the kinetic energy also doubles. If the speed of the car is doubled, the kinetic energy quadruples. Okay, and it's funny because uh, one of the students in my class today, because I was trying to, I, I always have little things to try and remember, and I was like, I can't remember. How am I going to remember this one? And she said, Miss, how about if you said that if you got a, a car and it was speeding up? Because it's got four wheels, then you can say that it goes by, up by four. So if its speed is, goes up, then the um, kinetic energy quadruples. 
Uh, but if you put two people in the car, it just makes the kinetic energy uh, double. So that might be a way to remember it. So thank you for that. Okay. So as I said, this, I think that's it for the uh, presentation. Yeah. So as I said, a lot of this topic is to do with equations. And in fact, there's um, there's a couple of equations that are not on here um, that you just need to be aware of. And that's to do with work done. Work done, again, is a type of energy. It is on here, actually. Um, now, if you're asked to calculate work done, do you remember I said for uh, momentum that there were two equations um, and you might need to work out one in order to work out the second one? Well, it's the same for work done. There are two equations for work done. So what you need to do is have a look at the pieces of information that you're given and see what you need to work out. And then if you need to take it from one equation and put it into the other equation, uh, you might need to do that. But you can generally tell because if it's worth about three marks for a question, then it means you've got to do a lot of work to get those three marks. Now, if you're not sure what work done is, I always think about if I'd got a broom and I pushed it along the floor, I'm putting a force into that um, uh, broom. I'm putting some energy into that broom um, and I'm moving it a distance. So in order to calculate my work done, force times distance would tell me how much energy I'm putting in. So that would be my work done. And then I could take that work done and I could put it into an equation for power um, and energy as well. Um, and power, power is measured in watts, what, watts. Okay. Right. And I think that is P3 in a nutshell. Uh, and let me just have a look. I don't know what that's all about. I don't want that either. So I'm getting faster at finding it. Right, let's stop sharing with everybody. Okay, so um, that's P3 uh, done. Uh, but like I say, I don't cover everything um, because you've got to remember that's like an eight-week course. I've just covered in three quarters of an hour. Uh, it is to help you with revision. But really what I will say about P3 is practice the exam questions uh, because you need to get used to using the equations. There's another one. Um, and um, and looking for the pieces of information in the question because they do usually give you lots of clues okay especially when it comes to the mass doubling and the speed uh, looking at those because sometimes I'll give you a data question okay uh, nobody emailed me so I'm hoping this has aired um, if anyone wants to get back to me can do uh, and thank you very much I'll see you tomorrow night for P4 revision thank you